right. So we we do have a it's a we have a, a town hall scenario. We have the hall. It's a, we're a very tight knit community. So um, please feel free to sit as close as you'd like. Um, I think we'll we'll start since we're at three oh four and some people need to leave to get some. Um, Get some trains. Um, welcome to everyone who's here and those who are on online uh, joining us. Uh, the weather is beautiful in Kyoto, and we have all held out to the very end, one of the last sessions on the last day of a very interesting week. Uh, let me just uh, again say thank you for sticking it out until the end. My name is Michael. I'm the new executive director for the Forum on Information and Democracy. Uh, I came into this role after uh, a 25 year career in international development, working on democracy promotion, peace building, human rights, and then uh, five years working in policy for uh, a tech company. So I've really been able to see which one I'll tell you uh, secretly, <laughs> no, <laughs> I worked for Meta for, for five years. Uh, it, it may not seem, looking at me, but uh, my career has been one from the periphery looking in. I've, my work has largely been in Southeast Asia. It's where I've spent most of my life. It's also been fascinating to see the development of technology and its applications for areas that are important to me, like democracy and human rights, evolve uh, over that time period. And so now I'm, I'm really happy to join the forum. Uh, it's a Paris-based organization. I'm uh, in Bangkok uh, still for the time being. But it's enough about me. I'll share a few words uh, for those who don't know much about the, the forum. Uh, I'll share some thoughts about that uh, and the, the announcements that we're going to make today about the work that some of the members of our steering committee for our observatory will be embarking on. Um, as I mentioned, it, when I worked in, in democracy promotion um, early on, uh, I really embraced the use of new technologies. Uh, social media, for example, seemed to be the holy grail of democratizing people's access to information and their ability to use that to improve their lives. Um, and I think in the interim, in the years that have passed, we've seen that our democratic governments aren't always as equipped as they need to be to address the harms that have arisen and the impacts that are being had on our institutions and our shared values. Uh, we've seen public space for real dialogue shrinking rather than expanding due to disruptions that technology is, is creating uh, in our lives. Uh, it's not enough to rely on companies to regulate themselves. We tried that. We were promised that that's the best way not to stifle innovation. Uh, and it didn't work. And so that's why many of us have spent the last few days here in, here in Kyoto, because we don't want to accept the false choices that have been presented to us, or the argument somehow that working at scale is an excuse to not always have to do the right thing. And democracies have noticed too. Uh, in 2019, uh, a dozen or so uh, democratic governments came together under the International Partnership on Information and Democracy. It's an international process uh, outlining some principles that democratic governments strive to, to implement to ensure that technology serves democracy uh, and information integrity and not solely private interests. That's now grown to 51 states who have signed on to the partnership. Brazil was the last country to join uh, in August, so just a few weeks ago. The partnership mandated the creation of an entity called the Forum on Information and Democracy. And so as an organization, we, we stand kind of in between uh, states who give us a mandate, yet as a civil, civil society-led entity, we are independent of states. So our board members, all 11, uh, represent civil society organizations.
the, the work that we accomplish is done through uh, multi-stakeholder engagements with experts around the world, an ever-expanding group of researchers, academics, and practitioners, uh, some of whom we have today who I'll introduce. Um, I think that the uh, governance structure that we have is quite innovative. You know, to have a direct relationship with government where we can uh, engage and uh, act on recommendations around policy that we have while working with uh, multiple stakeholders. Our organization is focused on uh, three key areas around evidence, policy, and collaboration. On the policy work, we uh, conduct research and develop policy recommendations that can be acted upon by states and by civil society and by companies. That is done through working with regional and national experts from around the world. The collaboration element is our emphasis on developing uh, value creation within our network of uh, civic partners, academic partners, research institutes around the world to contribute uh, from the bottom up, from the sides up, uh, into the, the outputs that we're creating. So that these are not just generated by northern thinkers, that it's informed by thinkers and practitioners from all over the world. And the last area is evidence. That's the first one that I said, but I skipped. And that's because that's what today is about. Evidence is about collecting and put, pulling together our common understanding of what we're facing. Our evidence work is embodied by the observatory for which our, some of our steering committee members have, have joined us in person. Uh, we've all found that an element that's much lacking in this space is a common understanding and appreciation of the, the impact that this technology is having on our institutions and our values uh, in a way that's systematic and that policymakers and others who are making important decisions can turn to and look to to inform the decisions that they have to make. The observatory is working on a, a regular process of meta-analyses uh, bringing this information together. The observatory's architecture was developed by uh, Professor Shoshana Zabouf, who we all know from her, her book and her work, as well as uh, Angel Guria, former Secretary General of the OECD. They spent about a year working out a governance structure and a process to make this a reality. So it's uh, a real honor to be able to meet our steering committee members in person. It was part of a global call for people uh, who are experts in their field, who bring a wealth of, of knowledge and experience to apply it to this, this idea of creating this common understanding. And so after looking at uh, more than 100 uh, submissions of candidates, we settled on 19 people, of which we have three in person with us today and two uh, online. And their work over this coming cycle is to oversee the production of the, the first uh, output from the observatory, the first meta-analysis. Now there's a lot to cover, there are a lot of topics and issues, and we can't do it all at once. And so the, the team met recently to talk about prioritization and where the group should focus uh, their efforts uh, over the coming year. And those have been narrowed down to a very popular topic at this conference this week, artificial intelligence, but also about media in the digital age and data governance as well as a cross-cutting theme of misinformation and disinformation, which is uh, quite important. Um, and then just lastly, going forward, this group of 19 people supported by a research, uh, uh, sorry, a scientific director and rapporteurs will be uh, soliciting uh, information, inputs, research, conducting working group discussions and so forth to gather information to fold into this meta-analysis. So with, with that, uh, I would like to introduce each of our steering committee members that we have 
and maybe in just uh, uh, two minutes, uh, share what uh, your amb ambition is for the observatory, how it relates to you know, your region uh, of where you're at, um, before we go into some uh, other questions and discussion. And uh, I'm gonna pick on Courtney first. Courtney Ratch is the director of the Center for Journalism and Liberty at the Open Market Institutes. And I think you may have other affiliations. Feel free to, to mention those too. Um, and uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to share. Great, thank you so much, Michael. And um, excited to meet the other steering committee members as well. So my name is Courtney Raj. As you said, I am the director of the Center for Journalism and Liberty, but I have a background for the past 20 years as a journalist, a scholar, and a human rights advocate. And so I bring a wealth of um, experience that has really focused on the global majority or the global south and understanding how um, technology and policies that are often developed in the US or the EU increasingly have an impact in shaping the viability of information ecosystems, human rights, and the political economy around the world. Um, my interest in being part of this initiative is actually because I'm also involved with the International Panel on the Information Environment. And I see these as very complementary efforts to understand what evidence exists to help inform policymaking, as well as, and I think as importantly, what evidence does not exist and how that should shape our approach to policy. And so what I would hope for this, um, this initiative is that as we seek to harness the evidence, is wh what do we mean by evidence? And I spent the past couple of years as a fellow at um, the UC UCLA Institute for Technology, Law and Policy, doing a lot of um, research about healthy information ecosystems, again, like technology policy, et cetera. And one of the things that stood out is there is a lot of information embedded in NGO reports, in books that are not peer reviewed and therefore you know, not part of the domain of the IPIE, um, that are published in reports in, um, by international organizations, et cetera, that include empirical research on the ground, um, qualitative and quantitative research, and yet, they all exist in their silos. There's so little, I think, conversation between them. And so we actually, I think we know more than we think we do, but it is embedded in all these, you know, kind of individualized efforts. And so my ambition here is to help us figure out how do we learn from the evidence that has been collected, um, that has been developed, especially through the on the ground experience um, around the world, and particularly how that differs by region, by country, by language, you know, by different stakeholders, et cetera, because um, the vast majority of published research, uh, especially in peer reviewed journals, is from global north, and especially when you get into inf information environment issues like the new, you know, new issues of disinformation, misinformation, which actually have a long history in propaganda and media studies and, and information science. Um, how, you know, so much of that is English focused. It's global north. It's a lot of it is either US or Europe. And so we don't know what the evidence actually tells us about what is happening globally if we think about you know, the hundreds of languages, cultures, um, politics, et cetera. So I'm really hoping that this initiative, together with the IPIE, will create a comprehensive understanding of what we know about these topics and where are the holes. And um, so I, I see you nodding, so I'm gonna also wrap up here, but I think you know, as we get into the discussion, thinking about where there is an overemphasis of research, maybe where we need more, you know, more attention because there has been an underemphasis and that we have to consider as well how research is funded and who funds it. So if you think, you know, for example, tech companies, when they're funding research, they're funding certain types of research. And so we also need to think about how what we know is shaped by who is funding us to ask certain questions and what questions are not being asked. 
And I'm also nodding because I'm agreeing with everything that you're saying, too. So th thank you very much, Courtney. Um, I think we also have online uh, Jalak Kakar, who's the executive director at the Center for Communication Government Governance uh, at the National Law University of Delhi in India. Uh, Jalak, are you with us online? Thanks, Michael. Welcome. Wish you were here in, in Kyoto, but it's wonderful to have you online. Yes, I wish I was there too. It would have uh, been really amazing. Um, so, uh, Michael, uh, over the last decade, I've, I've been working closely on technology policy issues uh, within the Indian context. And sort of the lens I really come from is um, how um, the information environment is developing within the global majority. Um, and it's something that we actively explore at the Center for Communication Governance, which is an academic research institution at the National Law University in, in Delhi, in India. And um, I think uh, Courtney um, alluded to this, but if I can just take it further, is that a lot of the policy thinking and academic research that is being relied on is emanating from the West. And much of that does not necessarily directly translate or cannot be transposed into a uh, global majority context, which in themselves are very heterogeneous and different contexts. And you cannot homogenize them to uh, uh, you know, be one uh, sort of uh, monolith of uh, uh, an, an environment. So I think um, my aspiration uh, for the work we're going to do as part of this marvelous project is to uh, be able to bring out uh, the fact that we need a difference in approaches, perhaps in, in different contexts. And that may not be a one size fits all approach. There'll be different cultural governance, regulatory capacity contexts, and we need to take that into account. I think the second thing, and perhaps that's drawing on what you alluded to earlier, is um, the fact that there's this palpable sense of a false dichotomy. Like the only options we have is take social media uh, you know, platforms as they are. Uh, and the challenges we have today with them, maybe at the most we can you know, band-aid and try to tackle some of the, you know, the harms that we see or don't have them at all. Um, and my aspiration for the time that we spend together over the next year working uh, on coming out with the first report is really to understand uh, perhaps there are many shades uh, in between, perhaps there are new and novel approaches. And many of those have already been sort of talked about in literature, but perhaps it's about spotlighting um, those uh, particular approaches. And then the last idea I want to uh, leave the audience with um, as part of opening remarks is, um, you know, in, for instance, in India, we are in the process of drafting a new legislation to replace a 20, 22 year old piece of legislation that regulates the internet and you know, online platforms. Um, and of course, tech companies have a lot of money power, a lot of access to relationships, and um, they have tremendous opportunity to, to shape uh, the thinking that's sort of emerging. At the same time, there's a lot of tension between these companies uh, and the government, and sometimes, you know, the governments uh, across the globe, as we are seeing, are experimenting with many different approaches. I think we have a unique opportunity as countries around the world are rethinking their approaches to internet regulation, platform regulation, to come out with a report that has legitimacy uh, based on the fact that it, it, it arises uh, from something that governments are also associated with, uh, that has the backing um, and the work and the minds of many civil society and academic organizations across the globe really coming together where it's not a one-off report of, of one institution, but really a global overarching coming together of individuals with expertise working on these issues. And I think it will create a resource that we can take to many governments around the world and which uh, will have the sort of uh, heft 
to make them sit up and take notice. So I think uh, we have a very, very important task ahead of us uh, in the year ahead to live up uh, to uh, those aspirations because we can really impact the way this uh, information environment with uh, globally moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. I absolutely agree with you that it's uh, an important resource. I think a living resource, much like the IPCC has been for for uh, climate change. Uh, and also your note about spotlighting research. And it, I think on the one hand, spotlighting and then uh, shining light on who's funding research and where's it, where, where that research is coming from. Um, so perhaps next I could um, ask uh, Jeanette Hoffman, who is the uh, research director at the Alexander van Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society uh, in Germany to uh, add any additional thoughts on yourself and what is your ambition for being part of the steering committee? Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I, my background is in political science and I've done research on internet governance since the early 1990s. And my recent research focus was on democracy and digitalization. Um, and what sort of motivates uh, me to uh, contribute to this body uh, are two things. First, the uh, focus on disinformation. I've noticed um, that most of the attention right now is on production and circulation of disinformation, but we know very, very little on, um, about its impact on people. But at the same time, governments really use this growing worries and concern about disinformation uh, as uh, a legitimization for intervening in the public sphere and starting to regulate. So on the one hand, I think we really need more data, we need more research um, on disinformation and how it works, whether it in fact um, affects people's minds and voting behavior. But there's a second uh, reason, and that has to do uh, with... Uh, high quality journalism. As we all know, this is an essential pillar of democracy. Uh, I think it's also one of the most essential means against disinformation. We can see already now that disinformation is less of a problem in countries with a healthy media environment. We had yesterday a workshop where a woman from Switzerland said, not an issue. I talked to a woman from the Irish government and she said, not an issue in our country. I would say the same about Germany. So if really there is a, is a tight uh, link between the media landscape um, and uh, disinformation. But at the same time, we can see that the, the sort of uh, traditional business models of high-quality uh, journalism is crumbling, not only because of platforms, but also because the young generation of users is developing new attitudes uh, towards uh, news consumption. So we need to really think hard about what that means for the future, not only for combating disinformation, but also uh, as a sort of condition for democracy. Absolutely agree. And just listening to the news this morning, I think it was the Washington Post is reducing, uh, trying to buy out 250 uh, staff, uh, another example of the impacts we're seeing every day. I think the other day I heard someone was saying that newspapers are folding up in, in Canada at a, a really rapid uh, pace. Um, let's shift consonants to uh, Cote d'Ivoire, where we have um, Nene Nwakanma, who's with uh, works on digital policy, and uh, is with the advocacy and cooperation. Is it? <laughs> she is a digital policy advocacy and cooperation specialist, uh, and she's in Cote d'Ivoire. Are you with us online? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, um, great to join you online. Um, my name is Nenna, I come from the internet. Uh, I think that's all the introduction I do of myself. I think I've worked with a lot of you on different issues, um, open data, open source, open government, open web uh, over the past 25 years. And uh, 
even before IGF. Uh, we've been around through the WISIS, the, the pre-WISIS days, we, we used to call them. Um, I have been working from the advocacy uh, point of view and mostly within civil society and for the past 10 years as the chief web advocate of the World Wide Web Foundation. Um, two things. On one hand is information and the, on the other hand is democracy. I like to use um, visualizations. I like to use um, illustrations. Um, inf uh, information is like bread. Um, everywhere you go in the world, there's a sort of bread that is eaten. It could be flat, it could be long, it could be with sugar, a lot of, I mean, they are, it comes in different shapes, sizes, and, and flavors. But every people have a kind of bread they eat. So it's, it's, information is consumed everywhere uh, in, in different shapes, sizes, forms. Uh, we may not even have this, the basic ingredients. I mean, we know it's flour, basically, that you used to make bread, but flour can be made from so many different types of cereal. And that, I think, is, is the same with information. Granted, we all, we all feed on it one way or the other. You cannot not be informed uh, unless you are dead. Even when you are dead, information about you is still going to go out there. So that is the nature of information. Democracy is we, we, in Africa, we say it's, it's like cotton, uh, yeah? The, the white fiber that you use to, to, to make clothing. Now you make clothing according to your circumstances, according to your um, weather. Uh, sometimes you have heavy clothing, sometimes you have lighter clothing, some others are better for cold, some others are better for the heat, some are very colorful, but some are not. Uh, so with those two illustrations, I would like to bring our mind to the work of the forum and especially to the report that is coming. And that brings me to my interest. My interest is in nuances. I think, I think Jalak has mentioned a bit about it. There is no one size fits it all. And my, my desire, my, my vision will be that the report of, and of course the forum will be a real observatory, uh, go beyond the major headlines and see, look at the nuances that exist across continents, across countries, across social, um, political and economic uh, circumstances and tease out those. So in one word, it will be nuanced for me and I'm going to be uh, having a close, a close look as we go along to, to ensure that we are bringing out the nuances across countries. Uh, the other thing might be the needs uh, because it's not just enough. Um, you don't build bridges in the desert because they don't have water. They don't have a water problem. Uh, I think um, Janet was saying that we need to respond to needs. You, you can come to me in the middle of the desert and tell me uh, you, you have a pro program for bridges. No, uh, unless you build a river first, yeah? So um, let's respond to the needs of, of, of our people. Uh, government have needs and once those needs are catered for, then our existence makes itself valuable. So once again, Yes, we are feeding on information in different sizes, forms, and flavors. Uh, democracy, yes, we are all uh, constructing our view of it according to our circumstances, whether we are heavy, it could be heavy, it could be cold, it could be colorful, but uh, everyone builds their democracy in their way. There is no one size fits it all, even in clothing. <laughs> That's why we have different sizes in colors, uh, in, 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 in shades. And, and of course, uh, needs are different and we need to respond to this. Once again, thank you for having me. And thanks to all who have kept on. I mean, we've been waking up every day at 1 a.m. to be here in Kyoto. I'm in West Africa today, where it's summer all around. Please come see us. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. I do hope to see you in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Thank you very much for that. And I'm 
I'm always going to remember the analogy of building bridges in the desert. I, I will use that and credit you. Thank you. And, uh, and lastly, uh, of our 19 steering committee members for the observatory, uh, we have with us uh, EY's global AI ethics and regulatory leader, uh, Ang Sar Kun, who is uh, based in Brussels. Please share more. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Uh, so yes, I'm the global AI ethics and regulatory leader at EY, um, but I'm also a trustee at the Five Rights Foundation, which is a foundation that works towards the rights of young people online, and I'm a data and uh, AI ethics advisor at uh, Afro Leadership, a Cameroon-based um, pan-African uh, NGO. Actually, about eight years ago is when my journey from being an academic doing research on computational neuroscience um, moved into the space of uh, data, questions around data, data ethics, and, and, um, and the internet recommender systems and such. And it was really, um, by initially thinking about computational social science, there's all this great data online and we're trying to use that to understand human behavior. Um, but pretty much before we even started that project, um, the research uh, translated into what is the ethics of using online data for means that are different from what the person was thinking about when they published that data online. Um, and it was pretty quickly then through that project that we started looking into also the role of recommender systems, how they are shaping the space online for people, what it is that they're actually even seeing in this space. And that was then also a project uh, together with Five Rights Foundation, because um, when it comes especially to people like young people, but also obviously also to many outside of sort of the core economies of the US and, and Europe, we have a lot that people are speaking about them without actually having spoken to them and understood from their voice. So we were working with Five Rights Foundation on a report called Internet in Their Own Voice, listening to young people, what it is that they actually want to hear about this space. So it's really from that kind of point of view that I think uh, what the observatory is going to be doing is going to be very important to look at the various sources of data that are being collected, the various research that is happening in the world around um, how data is flowing, what people are seeing online, how people are engaging with that, questions around misinformation and disinformation, in order to be able to, especially for policymakers, but also for companies that are setting up their governance frameworks around the information ecosystem, to make sure that they understand where is it anecdote versus where is it strongly supported evidence? Which of these sources of evidence are the ones that they really need to be acting on and how should they be acting in order to achieve true outcomes that will be beneficial? Thank you. Um, thanks for that. And, and appreciate the, the youth angle, which is often uh, not as present as it should be, uh, considering uh, how we make up our, you know, panels and the time it takes to develop uh, expertise and so forth. So th thank you for that. Now, as we, you know, as we think about the, this ambitious agenda we have uh, for the observatory to serve this IPCC-like function, to ensure that policymakers, as Angsar mentioned, have access to the the latest understanding, you know, the the state of art uh, research that exists and that they understand the sources of the, this knowledge because people or companies they may have interests in producing certain kinds of, of research. So the next few questions I, I, I wanna ask are kind of around to what extent the work of the observatory can move the, the policy needle in a way that uh, protects our democracies our shared values and the integrity of our, you know, information uh, ecosystem. And uh, uh, perhaps maybe I start with uh, with Courtney, who may have to to leave to to catch a train. Uh, in your view, you know, what are the most important uh, cross-cutting issues and methodological considerations uh, that the observatory and this team 
uh, should be keeping in mind and pursuing uh, during this first cycle. Thanks for that. So I think we need to make sure that we're looking at qualitative and quantitative and mixed methods research. I have found I'm a qualitative researcher also um, in political science, international relations with focus on communications. And um, there is a tendency to privilege big data. You know, people really like to use big data, um, which can give us some useful insights, but also can leave gaping blind holes, especially if we think about issues of um, data sovereignty, of inclusion and access, and how that ends up uh, replicating historical and structural um, conditions and biases, as well as, um, again, like the data access and, or the, sorry, the access and connectivity issues. So I think we need to make sure that we're thinking um, a, a multi-methodologically within the same questions. So how do we know what we think we know and what is the evidence base for that? Um, then I think we also need to think about uh, the different kind of methodological paradigm or the epistemological paradigm that we're, that it's based in because, um, again, when I did this analysis of what, what makes up a healthy information ecosystem, which um, was done for a, a group of donors called the Transparency and Accountability Initiative, which I think the OECD is using to anal analyze its disinformation and um, misinformation programming against, there's a tendency to focus on issues like media and information literacy or psychological effects. Um, how do individuals respond to disinformation, for example, um, to the exclusion of structural uh, analyses or structural investigations, and especially there's a lack of research into how those things are linked. Um, and so I think we have to also interrogate where we do have a lot of evidence, um, but also what that means for what we don't have evidence about. And I say that because if you look at, for example, a lot of the funding as well as just simply the access to data um, and the type of platforms that are studied. I mean, uh, so in the meta-analysis that the IPIE did of um, some of the disinformation peer-reviewed literature, you know, there's just this preponderance of investigations into a handful of platforms, specifically those that have open APIs, which links right to data, right? So you study things that you have access to. It's a lot easier to study what's happening on Twitter than it is what's happening on Telegram because it has an open API. Um, it's also easier to study that than going into a community to understand qualitatively how people are are responding or um, you know the, the links, again, between kind of the political economy and the individualized responses because that's labor intensive. It requires linguistic expertise. It requires money. And so I think we just want to be very careful about that because, again, when I was doing this analysis, there's a lot of studies in this, you know, kind of psychological realm, um, media effects paradigm. And part of that is because it's also to the benefit of, a, of the big tech monopolies, which do get the vast majority of um, studies are about, you know, Facebook, Google, Twitter, um, WhatsApp to a lesser extent, lesser extent Telegram, but there are many other factors and we don't have very many studies looking at, again, like the infrastructural and political economy of the internet and now as we go into the AI era. So I really think we have to use a cross-disciplinary, um, multi-methodology perspective to interrogate these issues. What my concern is, um, for example, is that we can study all day how people respond to disinformation on social media, but it doesn't matter if those social media companies remain techno you know, they remain monopolistic entities with the power, uh, the power to uh, dominate economically, which translates into political domination, which translates into policy, and that we're going to see this replicated in the AI era that we're in now. And you can see that, for example, here at the IGF, 
which companies are up on stage at the AI high-level panels or at the AI main sessions. Um, you can see that who's in the room with policymakers. For example, the United States, the Congress is holding a bunch of closed-door sessions, and it's a ha handful of large tech, big tech monopolies who are dominating those conversations. So we really need to pull in evidence from a much wider array. And I would love to also see this group look at what has the private sector developed? I mean, there are all these consulting firms, there are lots of domestic private sector reports into these various issues around data, around AI. Um, so what can we learn from a much wider scope uh, of, of research that we're, we're looking into? And I think, you know, <clears throat> as Jeanette kind of alluded to, is not disinformation is not just a it's not the, just the effects of disinformation. It's not just the production. It's also, we have to look at the entire kind of life cycle and the supply of quality information, which has to do with journalism, absolutely, um, but also with how information flows through ecosystems. Again, there's a dominance of studies into social media without considering the broader media ecosystem, the political economy of mainstream media or powerful alternative media, again in the US, the role of conservative talk, media, talk radio, or in Turkey, the role of state-dominated media, or Egypt, um, which is where I did my doctoral research, you know, the role of um, state-affiliated media. And then how is that going to impact data, um, artif uh, data and access information, um, the production of disinformation and reception, in countries where you have a state-dominated media system or a captured media system. So, you know, the, the, the challenge is that these are all incredibly complex issues. And so I think the challenge for us is to get beyond where groups have already focused and take a new and fresh um, lens to that and really try to get outside of the boundaries, particularly outside of the boundaries that are set by tech firms that are helping shape the research agenda through funding, through access to data, um, through you know, consultations and lobbying in Brussels and Washington, and make sure that we are also hearing from people on the ground um, in countries around the world and in Englishes other than English. Thanks. You know, Courtney, but as you're speaking, it made me think of um, uh, both a competing analogy to the bridge in the desert uh, of the complexity of, of the issue. And I've spent much of my life in Thailand, and we have this analogy of an elephant. They're very big. And if you're, you're blindfolded, and you were to touch the elephant's tail, you would have a very specific impression of what an elephant is. You might think it's this tiny creature. If you were touching the elephant's nose, you would maybe think more of a reptile kind of thing. If you were only touching its body, you get this, wow, massive beast. So I think the idea is that through the work of the observatory, we can get to a place where policymakers can see the whole animal of all the elements that go into it, and, and also it's missing. Uh, and, and, and I think the added complexity of this issue is that it is constantly in motion. This is not a static elephant, correct. right? This is a dynamic system. So when you, when you, you know, study one thing or when you affect one thing, it will have implications elsewhere, right? So the, again, like as I said, with the access to data will affect what what you know, think you know about things, and then that will mm -hmm. affect um, other aspects. And the the AI, I think, if you look at AI and you break that down again, like the the large language models work way better in some languages than other because of data. And so you so it is com it's like multi dimensionally complex, which is another challenge I think for us. Absolutely. Um, so given that complexity and, and all of the issues, and Courtney's mentioned many, many, many of them and other speakers already, I want to turn to Jalak and maybe you can reflect a little on the, the priority themes of AI, uh, media in the digital age, and data governance, and why those are important priorities to start with in this first cycle, and maybe why it's important to you, particularly from the perspective of uh, South Asia and the Global South. Thanks, Michael. I think, um, you know, we, we did have a, 
a lot of discussion as the steering group in terms of what the priority areas for the next one year should be. And given that, um, you know, the really the, the key theme that drives the work that we're doing over here is the impact of, um, you know, platforms on our democratic societies. Um, and if we look at the way uh, platforms impact our societies, it's it's very much, you know, I, I'm probably preaching to the choir over here in terms of saying that, um, you know, platforms are our new public squares. They've privatized uh, public discussion spaces. Um, um, you know, they have serious implications for the media environment um, in our societies. And, and hence, it becomes very, very important uh, to look at, uh, you know, uh, the media aspect as, as one theme. Um, you know, AI has, has such significant implications, and especially over the last few months, I think uh, there's broader appreciation of the way AI uh, can impact our societies uh, with uh, generative AI really getting uh, the spotlight over the last few months. You know, during the last US election, we saw cheap fakes and deep fakes. Um, you know, we have several uh, key elections coming up globally. Um, you know, India, uh, the UK, um, you know, um, many other countries across the global north and the global majority. And um, this is really going to be a playground uh, for political uh, parties and uh, supporters to, uh, you know, um, unlock the power of AI uh, for political campaigns. And some of it can be good and, and bring more voters into the fray and, and reach the marginalized and vulnerable. But there are ways that these uh, systems and technologies can be weaponized uh, in a way that's detrimental to democratic interests. Um, and then really the third uh, theme that uh, uh, the group has uh, chosen to focus on is um, that of data governance and um, really what uh, platforms are able to do. And, and the whole idea of surveillance capitalism is based on the notion that um, large masses of data are being collected on individuals. Um, you know, uh, they're being used both in personal data as well as anonymized, de-identified data forms um, in ways that really can uh, manipulate and have very real world implications on the way our societies, um, you know, function and the way our democratic processes play out. And of course, the cross-cutting theme in all of this is disinformation, misinformation, uh, which uh, is, um, you know, flowing through these public private squares, uh, which is uh, heightened by the use of AI technologies. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, in the context of so many key general elections around the globe, um, I think these are great themes to be picking up uh, and analyzing for our first report. Th thank you uh, very much, uh, Jalak, for that. And I, your point about, you know, Elections next year is a really good example of uh, many democracies are are preparing for the the threats against democracy, and there could be you know the temptation to rush into uh, regulations uh, very quickly. And in that vein, I want to turn to to Nena in Cote d'Ivoire, and you know sharing your perspective on you know. The, this idea of uh, regulations of the online space in the context of evidence scarcity or the lack of real sound evidence and the risks of kind of moving towards quick regulation and, and how the work of this group could help, help policymakers and advocates uh, working in this space. Nina? Yeah, so maybe I think you're being diplomatically correct in saying quick regulation. You are, you are, you are in Kyoto. I'm sitting in my house. It's panic regulation. It's panic regulation. That's the correct word. I'm, I'm sitting in my house. Anybody can come and fight me here. Nothing's going to happen to me. Right. But here is it. It's hype most often, right? Um, over the past two years, look at what has happened on the AI uh, uh, landscape. Even my personal self, I've had to go, go back to school to read AI and law because it's like everywhere, everywhere, everybody is crazy and hyping about AI. And, and that for me 
it's actually a red flag. It's a red flag uh, because as you know, the, the UN is going to set up an independent AI agency. It's setting up a high level advisory board to, to, to work on it. Uh, in the past one month, uh, sorry, one year, I think I've read about 50 AI frame, regulatory frameworks. In, I've, I've co-written one for Africa myself, the Africa AI blueprint. Everywhere, uh, it's coming up. It's coming up. Uh, yes, my yesterday session was on data governance as well, and and I'm helping. I still uh, adv advise governments on regulatory on regulating digital rights and, and media. So he, here is what what I what I think. Uh, understand before we regulate. How does this thing work? What are the implications? And that is where evidence comes to be. That is where the work we do comes to be. We, you cannot regulate what you do not understand. Unfortunately, we, we do this hype. Uh, we, we are moved on hype. We are moved on electoral uh, deadline by electoral deadlines. We are moved by, by panic and we want to do something quickly. Um, as someone in Africa. I smile. I, I listen very, very closely to Courtney. So, so now you are afraid. The, 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 in, on the media landscape, there have been big Western media that has been dominating the space for so long. And everybody felt it was okay for these big um, platforms, media platforms then to be, to be the bearers of a discourse. And, 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 and send us on a bias towards democracy in a certain way. The only reason we are now being afraid is that platforms are the new media and there's a new, and there's a new kid in, on the block and your own um, power is being threatened. So I think it's a power play here. And, and with being someone in Africa, I am smiling about it because governments are no longer the biggest stakeholders in the media, uh, nor global, global northern media, the biggest media. Now we have media in the hands of private platforms, okay? My last trip was to, was to the major campus in, in, in Menlo Park in California. And so what is still panic? It's still panic, we want to regulate because we want to keep our spares of influence. We are regulating because we are afraid. We are regulating because of hype. We are regulating because of electoral deadlines. And I think that uh, all of that does not um, all go well. And, and I think that the, the work that we are doing needs to like calm everybody down. What is the evidence saying? What is it not saying? What should we be afraid of? What should we not be afraid of? So for me, um, it's important to understand. Evidence is key. I've lived long enough, Michael, and I think you've been around to know that most often we regulate um, products. We are rushing into, no, this is fake news. Shut down this platform, then we'll all be okay. That is wrong. I think that we should be building on principles and we should be building on fair processes. And that is really very important. We've seen big companies. I mean, um, 20, 25 years ago, it was, it was um, software. Software was the big deal. Everybody wanted it was open software and proprietary software. And we're like, no, go down. Don't stop attacking Microsoft. Let us look at principles of openness and accountability. Let us look at inclusivity. Let us look at these key principles. So are we, well, let's not regulate products and companies. Let's regulate processes. Let's regulate uh, principles and let's be forward looking. So in, in, in dialogue, let me close with that. Dialogue is also very important. And that's what brings us to the value of IGF and, and the forum, by the way, that, that's where we have this dialogue between private public and civil society sectors. Dialogue, I think, is very important. We should learn that. And finally, um, let's, 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 let's breathe. Let's just breathe. Huh? Let's just breathe. Uh, panic, panic regulation. We've seen that. It takes us nowhere. And, and let, let's, let's breathe. Let's take a breath. And, and let's, let's look at what the evidence is. And that's why the work we do is here. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Nina. And in that, in the spirit of calming down and um, uh, finding out what we what we don't know and and filling in those gaps, maybe 
uh, and in the spirit of multi-stakeholderness, um, mm -hmm. Angsar being a representative from from the private sector, um, uh, maybe you can share some of your thoughts on, you know, the importance of gathering evidence to to create better, ultimately better policies uh, that will benefit us all. Sure. So, I mean. What Nina was, was alluding to, that we are in, in a moment in which there is a huge rush to try to come up with the right kinds of regulations, commitments, guidelines. We're not even sure yet whether things should be mandatory or not. Different cultures approach this from a different point, point of view. Um, but one thing that is clear is it doesn't really matter which of these approaches we decide to choose, and, and different countries will choose different ones, we also need to be having the tools in order to check whether or not they are being implemented correctly. And that means we need to have methodologies. We need to understand which methodology is actually going to work in order to assess compliance with, be it compliance with the regulation, say, Digital Service Act, be it compliance with commitments and guidelines, um, for all of these, we need clarity on what are the good methodologies for tracking the, the ability imp to implement these kinds of um, commitments and obligations. And so that's one of the things that a kind of meta-study approach to the research that exists out there is really uh, going to help us to understand by looking at the various different methodologies that the uh, um, research community, including academia, including journalists, including also work that has been done within companies, what are the various different methodologies that have been attempted, that have been used, um, which of these is producing the kind of evidence that is uh, most reproducible, most um, applicable for this kind of an assurance process to assess are we achieving the desired outcomes of these new policies that are being developed in the space to deal with the new challenges from generative AI, the existing challenges from social media platforms, the old challenges around disinformation that may be driven by um, particular interest groups, which can be governments, it can be companies, it can be other groups as well. But really we need, um, it, we need an understanding about what is the way in which to assess where do things stand so that we can also provide the uh, appropriate kind of um, recommendations. And so the kind of meta study that the observatory is going to be doing um, is going to be key to be able to achieve that kind of a, a baseline. Thank you, um, and uh, I realize that we're we're already a, a minute over. Although I don't think there's any session after ours because I think we're one of the last. <laughs> but um, I'd like to just give a, a Jeanette a, a, a moment to to share a thought or two, and then if anyone has any any quick questions, but perhaps Jeanette, if you wanted to share thoughts on uh, how you think the work of the observatory, you know, in a year from now, the kind of impact or a gap that it'll fill, and as a tool for, for moving us further into the future. From, from this long perspective you have of, of work in the field. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I think there is not so much to add after what has been said. Perhaps uh, two things I'd like to emphasize. One is that this f focus on platforms and social networks cut us off from research that has been done on very similar questions in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Exactly. It's not a new topic to discuss manipulation and propaganda, right? We were discussing these issues also in the 70s. Also the question of how easy is it to manipulate people? Do they actually believe what they uh, listen to or read? Um, that translates into the question nowadays, when you forward this information, do you necessarily believe in what you see? Or are you rather signaling belonging? 
say, you forward a message about that the US election has been stolen. Do you do this out of loyalty for Trump or do you believe uh, in your message? These questions are very old. And by focusing on platforms, on the one hand, we develop new skills, uh, say computational social sciences and stuff like that. But at the same time, we sort of forget all the work that has been done on these questions before. So that's one issue. We should not, as Nana pointed out, chase a new pick through the village um, every year, but really also ground our work on previous uh, research mm -hmm. and uh, contentious outcomes. And the second thing is what is really lacking in digital research is comparative work. And I hope that this meta study uh, will be able um, to look more systematically or also encourage um, um, comparative work so that we also get data of the many countries uh, in Asia and Latin America and Africa where not much has been done to gather data. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Um, and I also have just learned that there's a, a question from someone who's watching us also uh, online. So maybe I take that one and then one more. Yeah. Because this is actually the first time I've seen a question online uh, during the conference. So please let us know who you are and ask the question. I'll put my glasses on. I can see a hand, but. Yeah, it's Deborah. Would you like to ask your question? We need to unmute Deborah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh my God. This has been one of my favorite, favorite panels. And Nena, I was thinking so hard to try to come up with a, a, a story about the idea of expertise, the bread, the clothes, et cetera. So let me just say who I am real quick. And then I'm going to go to a question on funding. Um, so I'm a, you can see my name, Deborah Allen Rogers. I have a nonprofit in The Hague called Find Out Why. And we, uh, I think some of you might know who we are now. Um, at uh, One of the things, and I'm also from New York City. I was a clothing designer in the 80s and 90s. So when you brought up cotton and you thought, and you made the analysis for uh, clothing, and it's not a one size fits all, that made my heart sing. Also this time, because it's, we, we do know that. Any of us in the, I don't know everybody's age here, but I can tell you I'm in the above 55 crowd. Okay, so here's the reason. I'm going to go hard on the funding models. One of the things that I do, um, besides my nonprofit on the on an advisory side, is to really kind of challenge the way we fund research. Why? Mm -hmm. I got a degree in 2019 in international studies at Fordham in New York, and the thing that amazed me was how much time we spend in a curriculum studying the past. So I wanted to acknowledge um, the uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name now, but the woman from Germany that I agree with you, we have to look in the past, et cetera, in the arc. I would look at my notes, but I want to try to get this point and not take too much time. Um, we would sit in class, me with a lot of the, the very young, and then me as a not very young at all, and we would be reading the old reports and we celebrate these minuscule differences. And so this idea of in political science, reading this research and celebrating a 0 0.003 difference in something is something that I find very problematic from a design standpoint. So I want to ask this question about, we all know, all of us here who've had to deal in the world of funding, know that it's a political system. And once we get the funding, it is highly political. And if we make some changes in the middle of the funding, we risk losing the funding, right? If we're on our research path and we're like, this isn't working. We, this is, we're, we just hit a wall and we need to change it. But the funds are allocated for this one particular path. So my question to everybody here is, and I would love for everyone to join in this idea of redesigning the funding models to put in a flexibility clause that if when I'm doing my research, I find out I'm hitting a brick wall, I don't have to proceed on that research path and I get to keep the funding so that I can go on the new path that I've just discovered must be taken. So that's that. And then, um, Michael, you made a point about it taking time to develop expertise. And then this was the thing I was trying to figure out. What could we, how could we, 
quantify or frame expertise because I work with 15 year olds that have a lot more expertise in the digital realm than I ever could. And I'm sitting with members of European Parliament and US Congress, listening to people that do not have expertise in the digital realm, set policy or tell us how the world works, et cetera. And for any of us who are a little bit counterculture, um, we've been had the world explained to us many times over the decades. And I think being a New Yorker, this is something I find very frustrating when I've lived already through, you know, um, 9-11, AIDS pandemic, global transition in manufacturing and supply chains. It's a, it's, it's, there's expertise in the room, even if I come from design. I mean, if I humbly could say that myself, and sometimes I do try to get a seat. So I think the redefinition of expertise, I want to hear, Nana, I hope you can come up with a fabulous illustration, because mm -hmm. five-year-olds have more digital expertise than we do now. It's phenomenal. We all know it, who's seen it. They don't have business model expertise, my last comment, but do we? Because a lot of us are have grown up in and fed the models that are ruining many, many industries. And we celebrate minuscule differences and we archive really fabulous studies because they didn't make the one tiny little difference to get the funding. Okay, so let's let's redesign the funding models together. That's what I'm, I really wanted to say. Thank you very much. Th th thank you, Deborah. Um, we we do have to wrap up, so I think um, it was uh, Nenda was set up to answer this very quickly within a minute, and then the organizers are telling me we have to we have to stop. Oh my! Um, so Deborah, refreshing hearing from you. Here is what I'll say. Uh, one of the reasons I chose not to go to Kyoto is that there is a time to come and a time to go. And it is only intellectual probity to, to bow before new expertise. I think that my space in the digital uh, IGF space can be taken by those I've trained. I've been training people for the past 15 years. And I think that the, 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 the highest level of leadership is when we raise other leaders to take over from us. It is perfectly okay for other people that I've trained to lead IGF processes in my place. It is perfectly okay to tell a 15, old, 15 year old, I think you know this better than myself and let them lead. Great leaders are those who first of all raise other leaders and are humble enough to bow before new leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Nana, that's a perfect note to, to, to end on. Thank you so much. And thank you, Deborah, for the, the question. Apologize that we don't have time, but feel free to, to come up after. Thank you, everybody. Um, appreciate you joining us at the end of a great conference week. Bye-bye. Thank you.